Welcome to the Rest Region online worship service for the Capital Rivers Church. We are a community of all ages, races, and backgrounds committed to studying and living out the truths of the Bible together as a family. If you want to learn more about us, just visit capitalrivers.org. But for now, let's get started with some worship. Will you give love today? Oh, yeah. And will you be kind? Oh, yeah. Will you be patient? Oh, yeah. Let the Spirit call your mind. Oh, yeah. Did Jesus die for you? Oh, yeah. Are you thankful? Oh, yeah. Will you go and make disciples? Oh, yeah. Like he commanded you to. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Do you love the Lord? Oh, yeah. Do you trust his word? Oh, yeah. Can you conquer anything? Oh, yeah. That Satan throws at you? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. super grateful for the village that is our church family and um our girls want to share a little bit about just their summers and just um you know their experiences and what they're grateful for i guess as far as like the church community not just here but they got to travel a lot and be a part with either camp or youth corn stuff and um the church and globally so hi so um as my dad said i'm lily um I guess. Um, and so this summer I had a ton of spiritual just opportunities. This summer I went to camp. Um, I got baptized. I went. Yeah. Wait, what did you say? I got baptized. <laughs> oh, Lily. Um, and then I went on a volunteer trip to Mexico this summer. Um, and I think just one big thing that I learned this summer. Um, was that my time with God doesn't have to have a special location or time. Um, because as I'm sure a bunch of you know, we can all have like favorite like places or locations to go to God in um, or where we feel closest to God. Um, one of those for me could be camp. That could be just a special just place you guys can go where you feel closest to God. Um, and when I'm at camp or when I'm in Mexico on the beach, I have a lot of prayer walks. I just talk to friends. I could be open about a lot of things. And then I can come back home and be like, oh, now it's time, time to have a quiet time just in my living room and go about my day. But um, just it's important to know, like, those prayer walks that we have at camp or in our favorite places, we can do those at home as well, whether, like, I realize I can have a prayer walk while I'm just walking the dog or just, <laughs> just different things in my life that I thought I could only do in certain places I can also bring home. And do here as well. So yeah, I think that's something we can think about this week. Um, you can just spend time with God in as many places as you want to. It does, it's not limited to only your favorite place or your favorite locations. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Is this good? Okay, my apologies. This is slightly incoherent. Kind of thinking it on the go. You got it. But um, a big lesson that I learned over the summer throughout all the church opportunities is not what he was saying and <laughs> all of like the christ focused trips that i went on um so i'm very grateful for as well is just the unity within the community that we have within the community of disciples because even when i went to um zambia and mexico we were able to meet disciples and it was amazing because i didn't know them sometimes i didn't even we didn't really speak the same language but there was we had um a, we had a common goal we had a common purpose in life and there was so much love and understanding there and so much unity there I, they were my brothers and sisters, even if I didn't know them. And there was, yeah, there was, just, there was unity there, and I'm so grateful for that. And it also taught me um, a lot about the importance that unity doesn't necessarily mean conformity, um, that we can have different ethnicities, different races, different cultures, different languages, different ages, different genders, and we can still be unified. And we can disagree. And there's a lot of power in disagreeing and still being unified, yep. even though that's really, really hard. <laughs> but, yeah, just that... Um, I forgot what I was talking about, but yeah, it's the, the power of unity, and I'm very grateful for that, and especially in this church, in this community. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, well, I'm going to pray, and then we'll have one more song before Brian 
I'm excited that Brian is going to preach to us today. That's really exciting. Um, but before he preaches, during the next song, Brian would like all of the parents with kids over in our children's ministry play park right here to, to bring the kids over because uh, the beginning of the lesson is going to include a, a children's ministry component. So thank you, Brian. Um, and thank you, girls, for doing a terrific job sharing. Um, so now we'll pray together, okay? Let's pray. Um, our Father in heaven, we are grateful that we can gather together, and we're grateful that when we pray, that you listen to us. And we are so glad to be reminded that you made us, and that you made everything. Um, and that, that gives us a reason for being here, and a purpose. And we also think about how you said that your creation is good, and that you're pleased with us. And we know that you filled us all with so much potential. Uh, thank you for our, our church meeting where we can experience um, the beginning of your process of renewing creation. And we want to be bonded with you today. We want to connect with one another today. And we want to leave this meeting today uh, being closer to you, being more spiritually rooted than when we came. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So excited to be here. Thank you, everybody, for uh, coming out today and worshiping with us. It's so fun to be here. I'm just grateful that I don't have to watch this by a screen today. All of you that are watching by a screen that weren't able to come, thank you for joining us. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm thankful to see you guys face to face. Uh, you can't hear me? Let me go like this. So, oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I got it now. Okay, now I'm good. Now you can't. Oh, oh, yeah. Good to see you. Okay. So this is weird because now I got most of you guys did it you this way, and now I got the camera over here. Um, I don't know. We'll figure it out as we go. But uh, anyway, great to be together. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, today, we're going to conclude James. Uh, we've been studying the book of James for two months now, two months now, something like that. Uh, it's been great. Learned a lot, uh, a ton. And as we conclude James, we're going to kind of start or pick up uh, or in, sorry, where we began. Uh, James 1, verse 2 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. And verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. And then in the end of James, James 5, verse 13 says, If any of you is in trouble, let them pray. pray. And so James starts off by saying, Hey, if you're in trouble, if you got stuff going on, you should pray. And then it ends saying, if any of you's in trouble, you should pray, pray right? So the, today's theme, today's title is simply prayer. We're just going to talk about prayer today, uh, connecting with God. And we have a special treat because you don't have to listen to me for 30 minutes or 25 minutes. We have a trio coming up today. So I'm going to uh, read a scripture and then do a little bit for the children's ministry like we talked about. And then uh, Bryce is going to come up and he's going to share a little bit about prayer. And then my wife Lauren is going to come up and she's going to share a little bit about prayer. And then I'm going to come back and finish it off and I'll make transitions here and there and everywhere. But we'll have a, a good old great time today. So as we get ready to get into the middle of it, I need five young people who are willing to come up. Five young people, children's ministry. There's one. Come on up, bud. Okay, so you five, I want to know, when I say prayer, what is prayer? What do you guys think it means to pray or what do you think prayer is? Can you come over just this way a little bit so it doesn't go loud? Thank you. What do you think prayer is? Well, Anybody? I think prayer is that you are talking to, to God and you are talking to him privately. Awesome. That's great. I love it. Okay. What about anybody else have an idea? Are you going to go? Um, I think it means you're um, like talking about him to remind yourself about him and think about him. Love it. Love it. Anybody else? You guys going to go? Yeah. I think prayer means that when you have like a worry, you can talk him. You can talk to God about it. Amen. I think. Prayer is talking talking to God when you're afraid of something. Like, I'm afraid of the dark, and I pray to God every night before I go to sleep because sometimes I get weird nightmares. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's so awesome. 
That's so awesome. You want to share? What is prayer? I think prayer is talking to God. That's so good. That's, I guess, the lesson's done. I mean, what else do I need to do, right? Out of the mouth of babes, right? This kingdom of God is like these guys. Children, they teach us so much. That's good. That's so good. God wants to be close to us, right? And one of the ways that we can get close to God is through prayer. In fact, Philippians 4, 6 says, don't be anxious about what? Anything. But in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And that's exactly what you guys said prayer was about. If you're afraid, if you're scared, if you need help, if you want to be close to him, we can have God. Now, I know, as many of you know, today, on Monday, by the way, that's tomorrow, school is starting for so many of you. Who starts school tomorrow? Raise your hand if you start school tomorrow. Yeah? And some people are excited about it. Some people aren't. We're right, we're, and so when we go to school, there can be things that come up. You might get scared at school. You might get worried at school. You might get... Uh, what, uh, mad at school. Someone might bully you. You might get sad at school. There's already, there's all kinds of things that might come up when you're at school. And here's what I want you to do. Okay, so prayer is kind of like this, okay? You can remember this, everybody. So hold up one finger. This is you. Hold up one finger. You, you, you. Okay, now hold up a second finger. That's God, you and God. And sometimes if we're not praying, we can be apart like this, Right? Okay, so now what I want you to do is take this rubber band you have in your hand. This is going to get tricky. And I want you to wrap this rubber band around these two fingers. Just two because you just have you and God. Wrap this rubber band around two fingers. Here we go. All the kids out there, wrap these rubber bands around these two fingers for us. Okay. All right. So now you have now you, have you and now you have God. But is it easy to separate these anymore? No, the rubber band is like prayer. The rubber band is like prayer. When we're praying together, it's really hard to separate. And so as you go into school tomorrow, or if you're afraid of the dark, or you're going through all these different things, you can put this rubber band on your wrist. You can take it with you and put it on these two fingers. And it'll help you remember that as long as you need praying, you won't be far away from God. Right? You won't be far away from God. And actually, in Exodus 33, verse 11, the Bible says, Moses spoke to God like he was a friend. God wants to be a rubber band like this for us, keeping us close to him. And he wants us to talk to him like a friend. We can talk to God about anything, anytime, anywhere, all the time, because God is just trying to pull us close to him, just like this rubber band. Sound good? So as we get worried, as we get scared, as we feel these different things, just remember, we can go to God. Amen? Amen. Awesome. Give me five, guys. You guys did a great job. Great job. Great job. Great job. All right. Kids, if you want to go back to your children's ministry zone, as it was explained, that's great. Go ahead and do that. If you want to sit and listen to the lesson, I'll try to keep it fun for you anyway. But great job. You can go ahead and have a seat. Thanks so much. All right, now as we uh, transition a little bit here, let's go ahead and move over to uh, in James 5, where our text is going to be. If you open your Bibles to James 5, and I'm going to read uh, the end here. Brett actually read it last week, uh, but he didn't cover much of prayer, and so I'm going to read it, and, uh, and it's just so important to me, I think, and that's why I wanted to read it. James 5, verse 13 says, If anyone among you is in trouble, let him pray. If anyone, is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you'll be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being. Uh, even as we are, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced crops. My brothers and sisters, if anyone should wander from the truth, someone should bring uh, and someone should bring that person back. Remember this, 
Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. I think even as I started to prepare this lesson and think about it, all I really had to do was think about prayer and I was convicted. I was like, ah, oh, I'm not sure that I'm doing this right. I'm not sure I'm engaged with God in prayer quite enough. And this passage really helped me. And so we're going to share about it today and kind of share how prayer helps us and, and things we can learn from it as we go today. So Bryce, come on up. Hello again. It's good to see everybody. So I'm going to get into it. Uh, I have some scriptures attached to that passage as well. So we're going to go to the scriptures. I'm going to share a little bit about what I think about it and some experiences I've had. So the next passage I want you to look at, also taking your notes, is Mark chapter 9. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to kind of give a summary just for the sake of time. But it's a great passage. So Mark chapter 9, verse 17. This passage is a game changer for me. Uh, when I was early in my faith, which I'm still young in my faith, uh, we, we always stay young, right? Got to stay young in your faith. When I was early in my faith, this passage was just a game changer. And some of the things I discovered in it, uh, in verse 17, a man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Wherever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Jesus responded, Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When they, the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has been, uh, it has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Um, if you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that, uh, when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute, you deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus has gone, had gone indoors, the disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive him out? He replied, this can come out only by prayer. And in some passages it says prayer and fasting, which is very important. Now, this passage blows my mind in so many ways. One, just the scene. I'm very, I'm a creative mind, so I could just imagine this whole scene. And it, it's just wild, overwhelming in so many different ways. And... I can only imagine as the disciples felt, you know, after all this time with Jesus or this, just being with Jesus, they probably felt very disappointed in themselves and felt powerless in a lot of ways. And I can say I can feel that way um, quite more than I want to be. <laughs> and the thing that blows my mind in this passage that I was pointed to in those times where I feel helpless is the fact that Jesus gave them advice on something that he wasn't doing at that moment. He said, this can be done through prayer and fasting. And the thing was, he wasn't, there's nothing in this scene, in this passage that shows him just praying right on the spot and, and getting everybody together to pray and then it happening. So in my, in my mind, I'm like, wait, what's going on? Because he's telling them something that he didn't actually, he didn't do that right there on the spot. And that's why context is important. Because if you look at the passage before this, before he got to the scene, he was spending time with his father. He was if you know about the transfiguration, he was on the hill. He was with God. That time with God, you know, that time of prayer for him was like his, his, his fuel, his energy tank. And when he came into that scene, he was prepared. He was ready to take action. And that was something that rocked my world because for a lot of times I saw, well, especially growing up, 
prayer was more of a reactive thing. You know, you go through these situations, people say, pray for me. You go through something, then you go down to prayer and you really start praying. Once you run into those situations that you feel helpless and there's nothing wrong with that as far as breaking the glass in case of emergency type of mindset, you know, it's continue to go to prayer regardless. But one thing that Jesus points us to in this passage by example is that you have to be prepared through prayer. And that's what I want to stick today is that you have to prepare through prayer. And that's something for me that was a game changer because one thing that constantly would hit me and I felt helpless in was my ADHD. Um, I have ADHD. I got diagnosed when I was like 23, but I've had it most of my life probably um, just off of clear signs, clear signs. And if you know me, you can tell I, I got ADHD. But um, one thing about that, I was just run into so many overwhelming situations because I felt helpless. Like I'll forget things or I'll mess up in things where I really honestly would forget about and in the situation where others would see that as just me making a mistake, I just felt like I don't know what I can do about this. And, you know, there was the option to take the drugs or, or, you know, all these different suggestions. But the biggest solution that I found within my ADHD and, and continues to be a method of approach is how I go about preparing my day. One thing that I can say about most of us, and I can kind of guess, is we kind of know what we're getting into throughout our day. Like, like, you can think through your week and kind of give a summary of what you're going to do. You're going to have work. You're going to have to eat. You're going to spend some time with family and friends. You might have some spontaneous occasions, but usually that's within your free time. Um, so, you know, fill in the gaps because you probably have some go-to free time activities too. So for the most part, our day is somewhat predictable. We may, we may not know what happens within those kind of intricacies, but we know what's going to go on. And sometimes we, or a lot of times, we tend to try to escape those situations until it actually occurs rather than face it head on. So just my advice and also just from experience, what I've seen, if you can pray through your day before it happens, you can approach those situations like Jesus, confident, ready, and just ready to take action. And not on your heels, but actually on your toes. Where I'm from in the Bay Area, we say stay on your toes. It's kind of this thing, stay 10 toes down. Like it's it's a slang, but it's also just a constant reminder. Like, you have to be ready. You have to be active. You have to be aware of the situations and also the opportunities. So the best way for you to stay on your toes, like Jesus stays on his toes, is through prayer. So be prepared through prayer and stay faithful. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Bryce. Yeah. Yeah, right. Thanks, Bryce. That worked out. Awesome. Thanks, Bryce. Bryce covered uh, James 5, verse 13. If anyone's in trouble... Let them pray. If anyone is happy, let them sing songs of praise. He just nailed that for us, right? Man, be prepared. Pray ahead of time and be prepared. Lauren is now going to uh, talk about verse 14. If anyone among you is sick, let them call the elders, anoint them with the word uh, in, in verse 15, and a prayer offered in faith will make a sick person well. Oh, we have to change microphones. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I, I honestly, I have a lot of trouble with this passage. <laughs> um, you know, the idea that the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. I know so many of us, even over the last 18 months, have seen people that we love suffer physically in different ways. And in the course of our lives, we can probably all name a handful of people that were near and dear to our heart who were not well physically and who we begged God to take away their situation and to change. Um, and so as I read this, part of me is like, whoo, what does that mean? How do I enact this? How do I follow this? And personally, um, I was diagnosed with lupus when I was 23 years old and I was a very healthy, active, what? That was last year. Yeah, yeah, last year. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. <laughs> um, but I, I was 23, but I felt like I was 65. I had run out of energy. I was in pain. And I begged God, God, take this away. Take, make, let me go back to normal. Let me not live like this anymore. And when I read this scripture in the NIV, it says the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. And I'm like, what is that? That's not what I've experienced. That's not what I've seen. And I know that God is a loving God, so there's got to be more to it. And so as I studied out in different versions and in different translations, and just the, the Greek word even is sozo, 
which means two things. It can mean to be saved um, in the sense of being made well and being healed. And it can also mean saved in the biblical sense and saved from things spiritually. And I don't want to question the NIV translation because I didn't, I don't, I don't speak Greek. I don't read Greek and I don't translate it, but the, the Americanized kind of translation of this gives me some challenges theologically because as I thought about it, I was like, well, if I'm not healed, there must be something wrong with my faith. If I'm still sick, if I'm still suffering, if my loved one died, if somebody lost their baby, you know, if, if different things, it must be a faith problem on my part. But I think what I've come to see and appreciate, even though it's been really difficult for me, is the idea that that the saving has more to do with me spiritually and my spiritual health than my physical health. And I, I gotta be honest, I don't love that. <laughs> um, I, I kind of want to pray to a God that does what I want and kind of answers how I wanna see it. Um, but it makes me think of the passage in Mark 2 where Jesus has this whole crowd of people. And uh, you know, as kids, we even acted out in children's ministry and you carry your friend on the mat and you set him before Jesus and you say, here's my friend, Jesus, heal him. What is the first thing that Jesus does? Do you guys remember? He forgives his sins. And when I first read that as a kid, I thought, oh, that's great. But as I read it as a young woman with physical illnesses, a life altering illness, I thought that's not why that man came. He didn't come because he wanted his sins forgiven. He came because he wanted to walk. Like that's why this, these friends took him. But Jesus cared so much more about him long term. And I know Brian had preached a few weeks ago about the rope and our small little section that we're living in now. And I think that that's gotta change how I pray about even my own physical situations. That Jesus wants to be with me permanently, not just for today. Not And honestly, when I do well, I don't know about you guys, but it's harder for me to pray. I don't do as well at this. Is anyone happy? Let them pray. I'm really good at whining to God <laughs> and saying, "I'm this isn't going well, and this isn't going well, and this isn't going well. But then when something great happens, sometimes I need to be reminded like, oh, wait, God, you did what I asked. Like, thank you. But I feel like, so in Mark 2, I'm, I'm inspired now to see that God loves me so much that he may say no to a physical request I have if he thinks it's gonna help me be with him permanently. God will make me well when I pray in faith, but the well may not look like I want it to look. And so not that I don't ever pray for my own physical health, and I certainly pray when we have prayer requests for people that are in the, the church, I see God move and I see God, um, when we all cry out on behalf of somebody, I've seen God answer impossible things. So I still pray for those things, but also I pray for my own heart. God, please help me to spiritually endure what it is that I'm going through. Help me to honor you with the way that I do this. I, life is hard. I don't want to get to the end of my life and have God say, I don't know you because I'm not talked to him about all of these things. And so if I have to suffer through some pain or some fatigue or even something worse, but I make it to heaven I'm not even gonna think about that anymore. And so that's what I take from this passage now as I wrestled with it, that I've gotta pray about my own spiritual wellness and let that be my priority and not just the physical things. That's right, if it's not evident before, it's evident now, I married up. I get that, you get that. It just makes perfect sense, I get it. Thank you so much for sharing personally and vulnerably about your life and helping us kind of wrestle with that uh, more perfect in our life too. All right, so as we move on here to James uh, 5, verse 16, it says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you'll be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. I think that a lot of us are mature Christians here. We've been here for a while. We've gone around and just reading that passage can be convicting enough for us. As we've gone through the pandemic, how are we doing in our confessing our sins to one another? As we've gone through the pandemic, how are we doing it praying together for each other to help us through our challenges, to help us through our sins? Are we drawing closer to each other in prayer or have we allowed this distance to kind of cause a spiritual distance as well? I think that just as we read that really quickly, to me, when I read it again today and every time as I've talked about it, I've been like, yeah, Confess your sins to one another. That's challenging. But is it just so that I can share what's going on? No. It's so that we can pray for each other. Right. 
and that we can be healed through that prayer together because we absolutely want to be healed. All right, I'm going to close this out here in verse 17 uh, because I really love this. And, and as I was putting this together, uh, God really spoke to me. The Spirit really spoke to me on this passage. And so, and, but at first when I read this here in verse 17, I was like, I don't understand. Why is this in here? How does this make sense? And so in verse 17, it says, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Yet he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. Now, again, I like that and I get that. Kind of like Lauren said, I understand what that means, but I haven't seen that in my life. I haven't been able to pray, God, make it rain, and all of a sudden it's rained. And I have definitely not been able to pray, God, make it stop raining, and it stopped raining. I haven't been able to do that. And not just rain, but anything in my life, I haven't been able to ask this very specific request and get it like, boom, 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 now. And Brett talked about this a couple months ago, and he said, well, our linear time is verse is different than God's vertical time, right? And we can pray about something and God is answering it, but it just may not be in our horizontal timeline. And I believe that completely, and I believe that's true. But as I studied this out a little bit, I came to a little bit different perspective that ties it into the scripture and really closes James out in a very connected way. The passage that uh, James is talking about here is, uh, is 1 Kings 17 and 18. And when Elijah pray, prays for the rain and it stops and then it starts. And what's going on here is King Ahab had to come into power and he was the ruler of the area of the time. And King Ahab was not a follower of God. He followed everything but God. And specifically, he was a Baal worshiper. And so he was worshiping Baal. He was defying God. He was going against everything uh, that God uh, was going for. And the passage says, if you go back and read it, love for you guys to go back this week and read it uh, throughout your time and read the story. The Bible actually said God was angry. He was mad that this dude was leading his people into Baal worship and worshiping other gods and turning away from him. And so he's like, not enough of this. I'm done. We're cutting off the rain. Y'all don't, you want to pray to this God to work to give you rain? Try it. Go for it. He ain't giving you nothing. And so for three and a half years, it didn't rain. And then he, after three and a half years, again, read the story. You'll see there's a little fill in there, a lot of good stuff. But after three and a half years, God goes back to Elijah and says, okay, now go back to them and I'll make it rain again. And so Elijah goes back. They've been looking for him, right? Because he said, it's not going to rain again until I pray for it to rain. So guess what everybody was doing? Looking for him because they wanted to rain, right? So they're like, well, I've got to find Elijah. They're looking everywhere for him. But God sent him in a way so they couldn't find him. It's like those movies where they torture somebody to get the information out of him, right? They had to torture him until he prayed. So God sent him in a way to protect him, making sure. So he says, okay, go back and then pray, and I'm going to make it rain. So he goes back, uh, and of course, he goes back along, again, long story short, and he prays, and it rains. And that's awesome, but that's not everything. You see, the Jewish readers of this time understood stories. They knew their text. They knew when they heard words, and you've heard this before, when they heard things, and they heard Jesus and the apostles say things, their mind would go back to certain times, and certain things. And, and you, you and I, we read this and we're like, First Kings 17, what the heck is that? Like that's, I, I, but these guys knew the stories. They might not have known Second Kings 17, but they knew the stories. And so when they heard that story, they also connected it to another pretty cool thing. Anybody have any idea what that was? Anybody? Ahab, prophets of Baal, Mount Carmel, Huh? Yeah, right? So you guys know the story? The prophets of Baal, Elijah, Mount Carmel, right? They're sacrificing the, to the prophets of Baal. And he comes up and says, hey, go ahead and fill the water. Put your sacrifice on there and pray. And whoever, whichever God lights it on fire, that's going to be the true God. And so the prophets of Baal are marching around and they're stomping and praying to Baal, light this on fire. And Elijah's sitting there mocking them like, what's wrong with you, God? Is he sleeping? Like, and talking trash back and forth. And then after time and time again, that God, Baal, of course, doesn't answer in fire. Then it's Elijah's turn. Elijah gets up 
in the middle of a drought says, bring me water, bring me more water, bring me more water. He's pouring water on the sacrifice. He prays one prayer, boom, fire from heaven, whole thing's lit up. And the Bible says that it sucks up all the water in the trenches and all the way around. One prayer from God and he lights up everything. So what is, what's the connection? What's the connection to this and in James 5? Well, the connection is the problem that these people were dealing with was idolatry. They were choosing the prophets of Baal over God. And when they were praying and asking and what they were were lying on and connecting to wasn't God. They were going to something else for their strength. They were going to something else for their energy. They were going to something else for their comfort. You know, I think when we think about us in prayer, I think it's real easy for us to become idolatrous in our lives. I think it's real easy for us to go to put our comfort in other things, put our security in other things, put our trust in other things that aren't necessarily prayer. And so what are some of those things? Well, money. When we're insecure, when we're feeling scared, when we're anxious, when we're overwhelmed, we can try to fix it with money. Let me just throw money at it and make it better. Well, did you pray about that too? Or first? Or at all? Or did you just start throwing money at everything, trying to fix it with money? I mean, I think that's huge for us, for ourselves, and not only ourselves as adults, but our kids. Are we teaching our kids that money doesn't fix everything? Are we teaching our kids that prayer is more powerful than money? That they don't always need the nicest clothes to fit in, but maybe pray that God will work on their hearts or work in a situation for them. Are we teaching them that we can fix things with money? Or are we tell, teaching them that the true answer to everything is prayer and connecting with God? I think another thing that's easy for us to get caught up into and put our faith and our trust in over prayer is social media. Man, I was super convicted. You know, sometimes you're writing stuff down and you're writing a lesson. I do this often. I'm writing a lesson and I, I think of something and I put it on my notes and I'm like, no, no, erase, erase, stop, don't say that. Because it's convicting. Like when I'm worried, when I'm scared, do I pick up my phone and pop up Facebook and kind of let my worries go in Facebook? Or do I turn to God in prayer? When I'm tired and I just need to relax, do I pull up Twitter and find out what's going on with my football team and all that stuff? Or do I go to God in prayer? When I want an answer about social justice or I want help with my heart with some different things going on in this world, do I turn to Instagram to try to find those answers? Or do I go to God in prayer and ask him to make it clear to me and to work in the situations around my life? Man, I was convicted when I wrote that down on my paper because it is so easy for me to pick up this thing, hit the screen, refresh, have it look at my face, and next thing you know, I got all the answers right in front of me. Instead of getting on my knees or going for a prayer walk and going to God and pouring out my heart and my life to Him. Man, I was convicted. And even more convicting is when it comes to prayer and things that might distract us from prayer or idolatry and putting things before God is myself. I think I can put so much security in myself, in my abilities, in my, uh, my talents that God's given me, that I rely on those things to get me through challenges instead of God. When I started thinking about this lesson, this was the thing that stuck out to me the most. When I started thinking about prayer, I was like, man, I really don't think I pray as much as I would like to, as much as God would like me to. And then the first thing that popped in my head was, wow, aren't you self-reliant? I say, yep, I sure am. I sure am self-reliant. Like it's so easy for me to just kind of go through life and figure out and navigate instead of going to God in prayer. And I do it so often when I get scared I rely on my past experiences to get me through the fear instead of just asking God, God, help me 
to internalize, deal with, wrestle with my fear that I'm feeling inside. When I'm worried, same thing. When I'm whatever it is, I have a tendency to want to use my talent, my strength, my experiences to get me through a situation instead of running to God, trusting Him to help me as my first instinct. And that's exactly what the Baal worshipers were doing. That's exactly what Elijah was doing in this passage. It's not so much that the rain came and the rain went. Rain went. It's more about what do you rely on? Do you rely on God and prayer and the power of prayer? Or do you rely and trust on one of these other things? I think that's so important for us to wrestle with. And, and some of you probably are amazing at prayer and you pray and you're our prayer warriors and thank you. Please don't stop. Please keep doing it. We need you. Inspire us. But then I know there's others of you out there like me who don't turn to God first, who it's our second thought, who go through a day without praying through like Bryce does or have a hard time with a physical challenge like Lauren does and just push through it, white knuckle through it instead of asking God to move and change our hearts. I think it's really important that we wrestle through that and figure out where that is in our lives. You know, it closes out, James 5 verse 19 closes out and says, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. I thought to myself, why does that fit in? And I was like, well, because it's so easy for us to get caught up in idolatry. It's so easy for us to turn other ways. And we might be sitting here on this lawn right now or watching on a TV screen feeling like, yeah, I'm good. But are you? Are we? Or have we became so self-reliant, so media-reliant, so others-reliant that we've wandered? And we need to be have our hearts restored Not spiritually, I'm not saying we've left God or fallen away, but I mean, are we really connected? Are we really here like this rubber band? Are we using it? It's hard for me to pull my fingers apart. And then I do it, wrap it around a third time for a third prayer. I can hardly pull my fingers apart. The more I wrap this rubber band around my fingers, the tighter it gets and the harder it is for me to pull apart. That's the way it is with us in prayer, guys. The more we're connected to God, The tighter we wrap our prayer life to God, the harder it is for us to fall away, move away, go away, uh, escape away from God. And eventually if I wrapped it enough, there's no way I could separate my fingers. How important is our relationship with God? Is it worth fighting for? Is it worth praying three, four, five times a day, connecting, making sure that we're tight with God? I think that's so important. And I think as James closes out his book, He makes it really clear how important the power of prayer is. As we close here today, I want to transition into communion. And I want us to remember that Jesus is the one who made all this possible. Without Jesus walking on this earth and dying, we aren't able to have the same prayer life that we have now. The Bible teaches us that when Jesus let out his last breath, the temple of two was torn from top to bottom. That allowed us, at that point, they weren't able to have that relationship with God. But because of Jesus, that was torn and we are able to have this type of relationship with God. And so as we meditate and take communion today, I want to ask us to consider that, to think about that. Tell God, thank you. And just be grateful for the fact that Jesus allows us to be able to have a tight relationship, the tightest relationship with God that we can have. Let's pray. God, thanks so much for the time that we can be together. Thanks that we can fellowship with you, that we can talk about prayer with you, that we can be reminded of how important this prayer, this time that you and I right now, that we together are having as a body. God, that you are able to tighten us together individually and to you through our prayers. That we can think about you, that you hear our voice when we call, that when we're sick, that when we're scared, that when we're tired, I love what the five kids, they nailed it, God. 
That's exactly what this is for us to you, and we're so grateful. Thank you for Jesus dying on the cross so that we could have a true relationship with you, that we could be connected with you in ways that weren't possible beforehand. We're so grateful for that. We're so grateful that you knew what we needed, that you created us with a desire for you in our hearts, and we want to live that out every day. Thank you for loving us. Thanks for being with us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for enjoying our service. Make sure you subscribe to our channel. And if you would like to learn more about us, head to our website at capitalrivers.org.